and empowering the individual to create their realities. And that whoever wins the election is the one that gets their people to believe they should be more angry. We're not, mm -hmm. you know, we know, we don't even know we have the power to control our algorithm. You don't even, most people walk in a room and are just bombarded like I was when I was young with people's energy and being sensitive and like, oh my God, how do I manage all this energy? It's challenging to be the person that says what nobody's saying and sees what nobody's seeing yet or, or, or just seeing it from a different perspective. Hello, Kelly Rutherford. What an honor to have you here with me. And for all of our viewers, Kelly is an amazing woman. She's an actress we all recognize, probably from her iconic mm -hmm. role in Gossip Girl, which you know recently they've had the, the sort of sequel to Gossip Girl. I'd love to talk about that as well, what your thoughts are on that. But Kelly and I became friends a few years ago when uh, we reached out to each other on Instagram. And we ended up meeting and talking about all things simulation, hermeticism. She even named her son, who's a 16-year-old, wonderful young man who took on the name Hermes, which is which is great. And I was wondering if does that mean that your daughter's name is Birkin or something like that? Or <laughs> or Kelly, who knows? Not that Hermes. I know. <laughs> Exactly. But uh, but such a pleasure to have you here. Um, it's an honor. And where are we? Where are we finding you in the world today? Where are you right now? I'm in Los Angeles. I'm oh my LA. gosh! The I'm far close. away, LA. Well, geez, had I known you were going to be here, I would have said I'll come up to you and we'll do this in person because I'd love to catch up with you again. But what's been happening in your life lately? You said you were in the UK for quite some time. Yeah, I was traveling. I was in Europe for almost a year. Um, and, you know, it was just with my kids and traveling around and working a little bit. I was in Geneva and Monaco and the Cotswolds, which was so beautiful. I rented a little cottage and, beautiful. you know, yeah, just was in wellies and a puff coat for a while, walking my dogs. I could totally see that. Really nice, let me tell you. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it was, it was really, really beautiful. But it's nice to be back. It's nice to be back in L.A. and. That is awesome. Here. And so what types of projects are you working on now? Well, um, I co-founded a social media app um, about sharing knowledge and expertise. We'd love to have you on. It's oh, I'd love to be on it. Wiser, W-H-Y-Z-Z-E-R. You can download the app now. It's, um, it's, it's really, you know, I think, in, you know, we love Instagram. We love all these social media apps, but this one's really to get wiser. It's how do we share knowledge? And you know, it's a, you can curate knowledge, you can be an expert on the platform, you can monetize your expertise. So it, it's exciting. It's exciting. Um, so I, you met two young German guys and, and um, they sort of, they had this idea. So I've been speaking at tech conferences in Portugal and, and Germany, we're going to Rio and to um, uh, Copenhagen. It's been really fun. A whole new world for me. It's so fun learning That's a so lot. That's so cool. I yeah. had no idea. Yeah. Well, I knew you were pretty wise, but um, wiser is a pretty cool name. <laughs> it's cool, like right? It. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, ca it's catchy. So then, and then I was in France a bit. I did a series called Escort Boys, which is a French series that's coming out, I believe, at the end of the year. Um, did a couple collaborations, one with a shoe brand called Corel, the other with um, a sustainable beauty brand called La Bouche Rouge. Um, La Bouche just, Rouge. I like La Bouche that. Rouge. The, the Red yeah, Mouth. The, yeah, They're, yeah, it's a it's a French red. They do all lip, yeah, mostly lipstick, but they do mm -hmm. other things. But yeah, so just doing that and spending time with my kids and that. That's awesome. So, so, yeah. so, how did you get into acting? So, if you kind of take us through the arc of your life, did you always know that you wanted to go into acting in the earlier well, stage of your life? Yeah, I. I originally was really interested in international relations and journalism. Um, and yet, I don't know, I, I then I took an acting class and I love to go see foreign movies. I loved movies and I love the, the women in those movies. You know, I always thought, oh, I want to be like those women, you know, a lot of the, the European films. Like a and Catherine Deneuve? Yeah, like the Catherine yeah, Deneuve. She was awesome. These, yeah. Fabulous. I had a crush on her, even though like she was already way older you know, for me, but I remember, yeah, Catherine Deneuve and uh, Belle de Jour was like, wow. Exactly, exactly. Jean Moreau and all those women. So, yeah, and then I, I didn't want to go to college. Um, 
I wanted to get away from home and be on my own. And I wanted to do something that I would never be bored doing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I, you know, I thought I would give it a go Mm -hmm. and I did. So, and I, you know, many years I was started when I was what, 18 years old I'm 54 now. So it's been a long run and I've really enjoyed it. There were, there were moments I wish I had gone to college, but I look back now and I'm kind of thankful I didn't. Well, you're like the youngest, you're like the youngest looking 54 I think I've ever seen. Wow. I can't even believe it. So, I mean, I think you probably, one of the things I've always loved about people like Catherine Deneuve, and when I went to France, I lived in Paris. We've talked about this. I always thought there was such this beautiful aspect of how European women age so gracefully. Yes. And and I remember when I was at Allergan as president of Allergan Medical, I launched this product called Juvederm, and mm. you know which goes into lips and everything. And it's often probably the most overused product I can think of <laughs> that I have ever uh, been involved in, uh, because people inject so much of it. But I yeah. remember our competition was a company called Restylane. Uh, it was actually a company called Medicis, and they had a product called Restylane, and and we they had this whole campaign that was called age disgracefully, right? Which was sort of like these women who were, it's kind of kind of a cougar vibe and, you know, they could get the the younger guy type of thing and get the big lips. And, and I remember thinking, it's like, whoa, that's so the opposite of what I've always like venerated and looked towards because I really love that about the, the quintessential French or European woman who knows how to age gracefully and if I think about the American actresses that embody that, you would have to be right at the top of that list. Like, seriously, you if I didn't know that you were like into the European uh, sort of films and, and, and foreign films, et cetera, I had no idea. But now that you say this, it makes all the sense in the world because you kind of do embody that persona in a way. Mm, thank you. Thank you. I love I love the pace and the intimacy of those films. Yeah. You know, it's just beautiful. You know, it gives you a moment for your eye to actually rest on that person and they're having a moment. You get to it's it's beautiful, really beautiful. Very very different than the way we make films. But we do really good remakes of those films. <laughs> yes, we do. We, <laughs> we do. do really good remakes. We tend to like the fast rom-coms whereas you know in in a French film they'll spend a lot of time just showing the changes of meal courses. In like, you know, when you're sitting in La Durée or something and they're giving you all these different courses of meals, it's like, you know, it's very artistic, right? It's very artistic, but it is beautiful. It's absolutely Mm -hmm. beautiful. And I think we tend to focus more as a society than uh, than France does probably on function over their focus being more on form and everything Mm -hmm. about going to Paris. I'm I'm a romantic. I think you are too. Now that you're talking mm-hmm. about these films this way, I can kind of tell that we definitely vibe at the same kind of things on this. And um, what was it like for you the first time you went? So if you're into international and you're into inter- international relations and you wanted to go in that field, when was the first time you actually traveled a lot? Um, I went on a really great trip with my mother when I was 17. She took me to, we went to I think Paris and Italy and we, um, and I just loved it. I just felt so at home and at peace and calm. You know, I just felt a, a peace about it mm-hmm. um, and very at home. Uh, so, yeah. And then I just would travel every, you know, I would, anytime I wasn't filming, I would always travel. So, um, yeah, it was just always it's fun. My, Paris is my absolute favorite city in the world. And since COVID, I haven't been. And it's like killing me because I want to go. I'm going to a wedding in, in Italy, in Umbria, and I'm Oof. trying to figure out a way I can justify stopping and swinging by Paris um, on the way. But, you know, travel has changed so much these days. I still get to go to Egypt and I still do a lot of my adventure trips. But um, I, I just love going to Paris and sitting in cafes. Mm-hmm. It's wonderful people watching. Oh. The, fa- the street fashion is amazing. It's the amazing. food is so good. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. I could sit there. It's the only place that I give myself the permission to be absolutely lazy. Yeah, they do it well. They do it well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Italy. They're on to something. I'm telling you, you know, on to something or at least the balance, right? 
So at I this mean, stage of your life, so you're 17, you go to Europe, you you fall in love with it, and it's like this amazing place. So then what happened after that that got you into acting? I, I moved to New York when I was 17 to study acting. So I studied acting, and my acting teacher, you know, after about, I don't know, a year or, or less, said, you, you know, you're young, you should go back to L.A. Because I was thinking I would do theater. He mm -hmm. said, don't do theater. Don't go back and get established when you're young, you know, as a woman, especially go establish yourself. And then you can come back and pick and choose the theater mm -hmm. you want to do, which is, I thought, really great advice. And I was homesick. So I was really happy to get back to L.A. And um, yeah, so I, I just, you know, for me, it was it was really fun. I've always enjoyed acting. It's something I think you can always get better at, always expand on. And life experience only helps you as an actress so the more you travel the more people you meet the more experiences you have you have something to give back like with I guess most professions um but when I started my mother gave me a book well first she had me read Ayn Rand oh um which my, one at, at, Alice Fort, Rugg? at 14 she oh. gave me a stack of books <laughs> your mom is <laughs> a genius by the way that's she, uh wow. she gave me Louise Hay Mm -hmm. uh, Shakti Gawain's creative visualization and a bunch of Ayn Rand books. And I just looked through like, oh, and I didn't understand half of what Ayn Rand was talking. I mean, at the time, we're just like, mm -hmm. what, you're 14, 15 years old. But um, I got enough of it and we had conversations about it. I think I had a book, I had to choose a book report and, and I had to choose an author and they gave us the list. And my mother says, do it. You know, she said, do Ayn Rand because I have all these books of Ayn Rand. I said, okay. Mm -hmm. but anyway, so yeah, just, creative visualization. I think all those, I just would make vision boards, you know, when I was starting out as an actor, just so many people I wanted to be. And I, so many lives I wanted to live. And then there was this other book, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron, oh, where wow. she talked about how to integrate all these different aspects of ourselves. So that's when I started understanding we have all these aspects of ourselves, right? To, to be expressed. We're not just one thing. And what causes a lot of our challenges is having to think we're just this one thing or this one label, so or this, true. you know, or to label ourselves at all, which is why I find what's going on now. So interesting is everyone's picking a label. And I'm, I want to say, no, that's so <laughs> limiting. It's the opposite of what we should be doing. We should all be label -less. you know, we're infinite beings, you know? Right. And so it's, it's, you know, it's, in, you know, look, it's interesting. And, and again, again, along with all those labels, we're losing sight of the individual. And, and so true, you know, we, we, we judge people based on their energy when we meet them. It has nothing to do with, I mean, obviously, you know, if I saw you in that suit, I would think, wow, handsome guy in a suit. But beyond that, do you know what I mean? It's energy. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. energy. So it, you know this, I'm preaching to the choir, but there's, there's, so all these labels and all the stuff that's going on, but it's interesting as an actress from, from that point of view too, to see, you know, how we label ourselves, because it's fun for me to walk in and play different roles, but then come back and then play another role and then come back and see it's, it's an alchemy. It's, a you know, it really is an alchemy that happens when yeah. you're, when you do that. Anyway, I just went so on true. some sort of tangent. I have no idea. No, <laughs> no. I, I, it's funny you say that because last night I was at this party in, in L.A. And and um, I felt the need. It was, you know, someone asked me, you know, oh, who am I type of thing? And I said, my name's Robert. And and then and I and I felt the need to say I identify as he. <laughs> you know what I mean? And everyone was laughing, of course, you know, it's yeah, like that was yeah. a funny thing even though it wasn't really intended to be funny because people were saying, I identify as she, I identify as, and it's such a bizarre thing for me mm -hmm. to, to hear that. Why do I need to know what you identify as? Right. Right. right? And I why, mean, and why limit yourself? Why limit yourself? And, and actually that's exactly why I wrote my last book, which is called polymath mm. and polymath is really all about not limiting yourself into one thing in my career i didn't want to be only a lawyer i didn't want to be only someone who worked in healthcare as a doctor i didn't want to be only someone who worked in science scientific pursuits i wanted to be able to integrate all of these things and music and and art and 
architecture and geometry. And so I kind of just became the person that I wanted to become and what wasn't going to, I would basically rebel against any notion of labeling. Yeah. It makes it hard sometimes to explain what you do. Yeah. That's right. So what? So, so what? what? So what? And, and, and one of the things I love about Europe as well is that, you know, it's so gauche to, to in Europe to sort of introduce yourself and immediately start talking about what you do. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and even though they size you up, right. They still size you up. Let's be real in Europe. They'll size you up based on how you're dressed and how you speak and your diction and all of these types of things. Right. It's so, sort of like, um, in certain circles in Europe, it's very much like, have you been through the debutante ball process type of thing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. cotillion and whatnot, and, and whether there's cotillion for women or the equivalent for men, right? And that is, you know, did you become an investment banker? You know, what, are, what do you do? But you're not allowed to talk about what you do. You're mm -hmm. not supposed to. In the United States, we're immediately like, oh, I'm a, you know, insurance salesman or I'm a whatever, right? Whereas in Europe, it's very much... Uh, you know, more about who you are. Well, it's charming. I mean, it's charming. The mystery is charming. I think in the US, we we're so open, which is beautiful. It's beautiful. And I think a lot of Europeans come here and just embrace our openness, right? They're like, it's a breath of fresh air. And I think sometimes when we go over there, we we embrace the mystery and the sexiness yeah. of not knowing, of oh, Romantic. what a beautiful instead of a man saying what do you do he says that's a beautiful coat and you think oh my god well yes. thank you and you know <laughs> and did you go to the louvre and see that well no how is, is it good should i go there's like a you know and there's it's a beautiful unraveling of knowing someone right and versus just a, a you know a straight up efficient let's get to the point it's fun the, the role that i just played in this french series escort boys is a you know it's about these guys who um inherit this property and they have to figure out how to i don't know how much i can say i better stop but um anyway i, I play the american i think with the french, title you can figure out a, maybe french, part of the storyline well it's how it happens it's a comedy so it's okay. a comedy because they don't know anyway. and it's a french film it's a french series French it's series, French and are TV. you speaking English in it or in I speak English and a little bit of French. So I went through the script and I was like, okay, this is what I can say and we'll get home today at a decent okay. hour. The rest I'll say in English. They were like, okay. So, but the point is I came in as the American and they wrote this event comes in and she's boom, boom, boom. This is how we're going to do it. You know, cause that's very American. And he sort of lures me in and says, well, maybe there's another way. So it's, oh, it's, it, mm -hmm. it's interesting how, those you know perspectives you know how we're raised and and you know i mean they've been around a long time these these european countries they kind of like the mystery of it more. oh yeah maybe. do you feel like when you've basically gotten into character of the different characters you played how many films and stuff have you been in have you oh i have no idea counted i mean it must be lots right it, it must be tons and and iconic television series etc and as you get into these different roles, do you try to look at the world through the eyes of the character? Yes, and I do my best to be a reflection in a humorous way of how we are, how a reflection of how we are. So maybe in the way the pyramids are reflecting back to us, I think you know wow. when you're up mm -hmm. when you're up up there, you want to reflect back who we are and this silliness, how silly we all are. Mm -hmm. I mean, as an actress, to me, that's the fun part is, and it gets you out of the judging of the character and you just sort of go into, look how silly we all are, Yeah, you know, and, and to play it serious, but with the underlying, you know, knowing that, come on, we're all a little goofy. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever listen to, uh, did you ever listen to you know, Alan Watts? Oh, I love Alan Watts. Yeah. I figured you would. So yeah. one of my favorite quotes by Alan is, mankind only suffers because he takes too seriously what the gods made for fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's interesting because I'm talking with you and it's making me think about you playing all these different roles is no different than us going through lives of incarnation playing different roles. Yes. And you've just basically brought it all these different roles into different perspectives into this lifetime. 
Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like a, a fractal microcosm yeah. of, a, of a larger macro experience that we're all going through. And mm-hmm. we all have to put on mask. Even the word persona means mask in, in Latin. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, during COVID, we all experienced, right? Some people fell in love with their masks. <laughs> I know. And they didn't want to yeah, give yeah. up those masks, right? And mm-hmm. and now I, I heard a term recently that, you know, refers to people that are still wearing masks all the time. And mm-hmm. there's like a whole backlash against people that still wear a mask all the time. You probably noticed. And, and people get kind of upset about it and everything. It's like, just chill out, just chill out. But it's interesting because I think that was such a collective reflection on society of how we've all been wearing masks and we didn't even realize it. And I think that COVID happening was part of a collective conscious expansion for us to come to the realization that, wait a minute, I've been living in many ways a life that might be even a lie to myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not honest with myself. I'm suppressing my emotions. These are all different forms of masks. And and so as you've kind of looked back on your life over the last few years, have you noticed a different way that you're starting to see the world and what this reality is? Well, the reason we we were wearing the masks was out of fear. So it's it's the same reason we wear the masks. You know, the other masks, right? Any mask mm-hmm. you're wearing has probably been based out of from a fear-based place. Maybe not all. Um Yeah, I, I think this whole this whole experience has has really um, brought out who we are, you know, and and brought up a lot to be healed and to be seen and to be revealed. You know, the veils are being lifted, yeah. and it's a lot depending on what your perspective is or how mm-hmm. you look at things. You know, what's going on can be the scariest thing or can be the most wonderful thing. You know, so mm-hmm. again, it's all our perspective on how we're seeing all of this unfold. And, you know, that may change hourly and daily given what's going on in the world, right? So it's how we continue to perceive and 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 also bring in the future. So what, what are we doing to bring in a future that we want to see? And how are we contributing to where all of all of this is moving? So I think we've been really in the dark about how powerful we are, how... Hmm infinite we are how what what we're really what this is all really about you know i think it's happened more and more and i think because or at least i felt right before everything sort of got locked down and all of this happened i felt such an it was it was i was floating and i was walking around thinking i was in new york and i thought this looks like a film set to me right before i left new york i said this to my friend we're walking down the street and i said it doesn't even feel real. Does this feel real to you? I said, I'm having these weird, where it was like the Truman show, you know, a bit of like the Truman show where I felt like it was just like, that's a, is this real, you know? And, you know, I'm the most real. I mean, you know, I love, I'm a material girl. I love to shop. I'm very much of this world. So it wasn't a spiritual. And I, you know, I, I'm not like being in the spiritual community or the Hollywood community or anything. I've always just kind of done my own thing, right? And just taken information in, enjoyed mm-hmm. it all, embraced it all, right? So, you know, I just, anyway, so it was right before all this happened that I, and I literally, I, I put a table in my living room and I couldn't stop meditating. And I didn't meditate that much. I'm not a meditator. I'm like a, an efficient doer, to-do list like, let's get it done. How do we do it mm-hmm. the most efficient way? And I just don't listen to a lot of anything. So I, I feel like I'm connected more because I don't bring in a lot of information. Yeah. So I'm more all day sort of listening and medit. I don't know. I think it's like media hygiene. <laughs> media hygiene is a thing today. It's so it's important. A, I think de- I, I don't a, even watch the news anymore. It's a detox. So um, yeah, we just have to, so in that I couldn't stop meditating and it felt like something huge was being squashed because, and I was, this is the weirdest thing. Like I felt like, and it was right around the time I was feeling all these things. And again, it could have been just me feeling whatever I was feeling. I was moving. There were things going on. Uh, 
so it's almost like a distraction from this thing that's that's really going on um all of this stuff and it's it's also a crumbling obviously a crumbling of the old you know it's it's sort of like that big tree that falls there's a lot of dirt and debris that comes and yet there's mm-hmm. all these sprouts sprouting you know you don't see yep. the little the new mm-hmm. new coming in so we're seeing a lot of just that part of of things happening and dismantling obviously the the fallout of that um so so what do you I think did, that i mean you just references like what do you think really the purpose of all of this is i believe there's been a lot of frequency control on the planet and we're realizing how powerful we are and it's it's scary and it's scary to think that not scary it's it's more just a lot it's a lot to see what we thought was real or good may not have been so and i it's like mm. it's like waking up and realizing oh my god these aren't this isn't really my family i wasn't really re- these people aren't who i thought right. they were and there's a huge moment there and you need a moment to sort of go let me integrate this there's a lot of integration of truth being revealed at one time so we're seeing that across every aspect of society too every aspect like you know whether it's religions that all of a sudden people have become so rapidly disenfranchised with uh because we're you know things are being exposed about those like it's like a global exposure fest right now on every (laughs) level and then the same thing is true for government you know i used to feel like okay our government leaders they're imperfect we i always understood that but I didn't realize how institutionally imperfect it actually is. And even the concept of, of representation is a, is, you know, something that is an agency aspect of government that, you know, we don't, we, we, we're not actually a democracy. We're a representative democracy or what we're a Republic actually. Right. And so this concept of representation introduces agency and agency introduces corruption opportunity. And I didn't really embrace that or understand it um, until, you know, seeing the events be so starkly, you know, plastered in front of my face on every level. And that was hard for me to grasp because it was so anathema to everything I thought I was. And I didn't realize that that construct of my own conditioning bias of goodness in in government and institution and pharma and you name it. until it really was such a massive and stark contrast to the reality that we were living. And I think that was just a, a huge aha moment, at least for me. I, I, I was asked to speak at the United Nations last year. So I spoke at the UN and, and I'm like thinking, what am I gonna say? And I got up and I said, all government's corrupt. Funny part was I thought for sure everyone would be like, what? I mean, this guy's speaking here. <laughs> And uh, like, no one disagreed with me. Well, it's just business deals being done. You know, I mean, I I believe it's, you know, we can look at it from, okay, it's, yes, it's that. It's also just business. You know, I think people see things differently. You know, some people see it as, well, it's just business. We're just doing business, countries doing business deals, corporations doing business deals. I mean, I've even seen, you know, the entertainment business, you know, agencies merging over a soccer because they have more soccer. And I'm thinking soccer, what are we doing? This is a theatrical agent. What do we do? You know, it's all changing. You know, it's, it's, it's corp, it's more corporate, it's more business. So it's, and so, you know, this, the interest of the, 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 the person, the individual is, we have to look out for ourselves now. That's all. We're just, you know, it's become more and more business, it seems, you know, and 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 a lot of people running things that, you know, we assume they have our best interest. You know, you assume that your parents or the school or the government has your best interest. And what it's saying to us is you need to be a Jedi. This is your Jedi training because, mm-hmm. you know, whether corporate's just saying, look, it's not our responsibility anymore or whatever. You can see it, or in other words, it's perspective, right? You can see it as bad, yeah. which you know, you can see it. It is, I mean, 
or you can see it as this is our opportunity to um, you know, really, even with Instagram, I was thinking the other day how it, you know, reads your thoughts. I think of a pair of shoes and literally those shoes come up on my screen. Yeah, and yeah. I was amazing. thinking, you know, but isn't that a reflection of if all the, th if we realized how powerful the thoughts we were that we're thinking all day long, that we're, they are creating, if we were all raised the way, let's say the Dalai Lama was raised or educated, if we were all raised as divine beings, infinite divine beings, we would, our thoughts would only pull in what we wanted them to pull in. And we wouldn't, we would be able to out smart that. Do you see what I mean? The only oh, difference yeah. is we haven't been raised that way. We haven't been given that. There's a great book called Bringers of the Dawn. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just about we've been in the darkness, you know. We've been we've been in a it, we haven't been like what you're going and seeing. Every time you go back to Egypt, more lights turn on, yeah. right? Yeah, so because it's, it's not Egypt that's changing; it's our consciousness that's changing. It's all there. It's all there, right? It's it's like these films, you know, where it's just it's it's. Yeah, it's it's opening up to the fact that maybe what we've been told isn't isn't a complete truth. We've seen we're we're, we're only seeing a fragment, a little, an aspect of truth. one facet of truth is what we've been seeing. That's how I feel about it, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I feel like what I had to dismantle was my notion that my truth was the objective truth. And that was the hardest thing, because I had to realize that my truth was really only one facet of a larger prism of truth that has many, many facets. Mm -hmm. Maybe if it's 360 degrees, each degree could have its own facet. Maybe it's even way more than that. Maybe the only objective truth could be the sum of all possible facets of truth. And, and that's where I realized, wait a minute, my existence is not at all what I thought. And, you know, things that influenced me throughout my life, Ayn Rand is definitely one. So I want to touch on that with you. I'd love to hear how you think all this might connect in some way to what Ayn Rand was teaching in, in two of my favorite books, Atlas Shrugged and Fountainhead, which probably mm -hmm. you've read both. Mm -hmm. uh, Fountainhead, I found to be phenomenally powerful. Mm -hmm. Because it really speaks to the creator mindset and, and how society, which is really just a reflection of us, it's a, a you inverse, can basically have somewhat of a, a virus reaction to creators, mm -hmm. right? And, and want to stamp it out type of thing and take it away. And we've lived in an economy and world that's been very much oriented around intermediaries and people that are representatives through agency, which again introduces all this risk and stuff in, but it seems like now society is moving more towards creator-based economies. Uh, you know, that's why we have people that now have titles like contentainment specialists, right? On social media, or I'm a social influencer or, or whatever you want to call yourself, you know, along with your pronoun. But mm -hmm. the, the, how do you think what Ayn Rand was teaching might apply to what we're experiencing today? Well, we're we're co-creating all all day long, right? We're co-creating with whatever we engage with. So, just like right now, we can blame, put the blame on people, but we've we've we haven't we're we're having to wake up and do the work too. You know what I mean? We're having to step into our power as well. So I can look at my divorce and I can say, oh, it's all his fault, but it wasn't all his fault. <laughs> You know, no matter how bad it may have felt like it, you know, it wasn't. So how was I engaging with that energy? What was my part? What part did I play? How did I navigate it? So those are my lessons and my takeaway, what I needed to learn. That, that was the sounds next wiser. Step. That sounds wiser <laughs> for sure. Wiser, wiser. So it's the same with, with what we're engaging with now. You know, we can say, oh, this is all corruption. This is all bad. You know, it's been done to us. Or we can say, well, maybe, you know, 
some people kind of knew what was going on. Some people kind of saw this coming. Some people made certain choices. We just chose, you know, it, we're all evolving differently. And I think when it comes to someone like Ayn Rand, she's, you know, she's for the individual. And that, you know, if you're willing to work hard, you're willing to open your eyes to things, you're willing to not just go along with the program and expect, you know, we're seeing that a lot with this generation of, you know, we'll expect everything, but they don't have, there's not a work ethic. I mean, I was raised with a work ethic, you know, there were certain things that you had to show up and do. So it's, 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 it's. We're the Gen X generation, that's us. Gen Xers, we are all cra crazy hard workers. It's funny. It's, yeah. And now we realize you could just, you literally can just sit and manifest it, which is, you know, we don't I know. Why, why would we working I think the younger so generations hard? that are, so that are really into it, they understand they can just manifest stuff. It's like, oh, what are you doing? I'm meditating and manifesting right now. Oh, okay, cool. Right, yeah. Right. Let me, Allowing let me get back in. to my nine to five. Right. Allowing it in. But it is, it's a, it, you know, it's, it's taking the individual and empowering the individual to create their realities, whether, you know, how, if you say it in the way that Ayn Rand says it, or you say it in the way, you know, Esther Hicks says it, or you say it in the way, whatever, you know, whoever's saying it, it's about taking responsibility for your, your co-creations and your thoughts. And the more we can get ahead of that now, you know, particularly with AI, particularly with our phones getting way ahead of us and our algorithms, they know our algorithms more than we do because, they're they're focused on it. We're not. Mm -hmm. You know, we know we don't even know we have the power to control our algorithm. You don't even most people walk in a room and are just bombarded like I was when I was young with people's energy and being sensitive and like, oh my God, how do I manage all this energy? And then I realized, oh, you have to create the energy in the room. You walk through the the room with your energy and it's you're creating the reality. So the difference is the world's happening to me, all this is happening, or you know, the Jedi is that you can just literally walk right through it. You walk right through all that energy and nobody even notices you're there if you choose to do that. You know, how big, how expansive you want your energy to be, if you want to be cloaked and you don't want to have your energy out there in the world. These are all things, you know, it's like Harry Potter, you know, that goes on. There are schools like that. You know, we think it's a oh, movie. Yeah. We think oh, no. Star Wars is a movie. We think that, you know, all these are movies, but you know, if you look at, there's so much more. And if we can open up to the possibility of it, just even the possibility, you'll start to see evidence. And so I think Ayn Rand in her own way was talking about that, obviously in a sort of more political economic way, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, And, it, and it's, I think it's challenging to be what she was really saying, challenging to be the individual. It's challenging to be the person that says what nobody's saying and sees what nobody's seeing yet or, or, or just seeing it from a different perspective. It's challenging to walk through society and be that person. And if it's, it feels very like you don't know what you're talking. It makes you feel like you're the one that doesn't know. Right. So, um, you know, but it's all shifting. It's all changing. It's a very exciting time. It's a very exciting time, you know? It really is. You know, I, I tend to think of this world no longer as a matrix mm. because the matrix in my mind implies it's something I have no control over and that it actually controls me. And I've changed the terminology now in my own lexicon to creatrix. Yeah. And the reason I say that is because I fundamentally believe that we choose it all. Mm -hmm. That every experience that we have in the context of our higher self has been chosen by us for our ultimate learning and our ultimate benefit. So everything that happens to us, we may think it happened to us, but nothing really happens to us except for that which we believe happened to us. It's our perception that dictates reality and it's retrocausal. So the moment that you believe something truly and completely, it will manifest in your reality. 
That can be through a subconscious expectation, or it can be through an intentional desire, right? Or a mantra. But I fundamentally believe that we're creating every single experience we have moment by moment. And that's why the best thing we can do is to just go through life and trust the universe and realize that the universe isn't happening to me, rather it's happening for me. Mm-hmm. And Certainly, that for me can yeah. be a very beautiful thing. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So beautifully said. If we if we really act as if everything that's happening, we've chosen and engage with it as a co-creation. Um, it, it's it, it, it's really a much different experience, you know, it's a much more empowering experience to to see the world that way and to engage with the world that way. I see you as someone who is, um, I'm sure you have faced challenges in your life. And I'm sure that because you don't get to where you get and where you've gotten to uh, without having faced a lot of different, you know, diverse experiences and challenge, difficult, you know, uh, tribulations and, and mm. trials. How have you dealt with those things? And and because obviously to be an actress, um, especially at, you know, at this stage of your life, I can imagine it's not, it can't be easy. Mm. And so you have to probably deal with, you know, rejection and difficulty and challenge, and you have to be really resilient. How do you maintain mm. your resilience? What is it that sort of is your inner compass and your true north that allows you to maintain your resilience and not get discouraged? Well, the number one thing is to keep love in your heart. So no matter what challenges you face, is if, if you can keep love in your heart and, and keep stay a loving person, you're going to come out of it much, much better for everyone involved, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is, is perspective on it. So, you know, you can, I feel like it's, I'm having the most fun ever at this age and time of my life. I'm, I'm the most, uh, I'm the happiest I've ever been in many ways and content and I feel really good. So I think all of those things that we call, whatever you want to call it, you know, whether you're an actress and you get rejected or you're going up for a job and you, you see it as that. I, and this is cliche, but you're being re- redirected. You're not, you're not right. being, you know, everything that happens, if you, again, it's how you engage with it. It's how you engage with what mm-hmm. is presented. And it's also what you're creating with your thoughts. So it's a two, two-sided thing. So the more, the more you are looking at the highest outcome for yourself, the more alignment there will be in your life and the less of those other things there will be. So you're weeding out. If you, if you go up against it without your own intention, your own knowing your own Jedi, it's more challenging because it becomes more personal other than trust. It's, it's really being honest with yourself and trusting um, and creating. It, so it's taking responsibility in your creation. What is it I? What is it I'm creating? What is it I want? What is, you know, and you know, we know if we write about it and we visualize it, it, it does. It creates. It happens, and in better ways than we could ever imagine. Especially, if we just keep being open and, and allowing it. I think these challenges, you know, we can see them as challenges or, and of course it, it certainly is when you're in them, it, it's, mm-hmm. you know, you're, mm-hmm. you're in it, but you're in it figuring out what, are, what am, what is this? What am I here to learn? What is yes. this? Why is this? Why is this happening? And this is as awful as it feels. It's good. It's like when you're working out, you know, it's like you're sweating or whatever you're running. And of course it feels like, ugh. And mm-hmm. the shower feels so good at the end and the smoothie and the whatever, but, you know, it's like in it, it's like, it's kind of like how I see all those things is it's just a part of, and, and it happens less and less. So those things I believe happen less and less. If you, mm-hmm. 
once you align and once you mm-hmm. realize that you're creating it, once you realize, oh my gosh, I'm creating all this stuff. So what do I need to do to create more of this other stuff that I want and less of this over here? And a lot of it is patterning. So we grow up with certain patterning and it takes yeah. us time to unravel what we've been taught. It's so the uh, Yoda. That's the Yoda line. You must unlearn what you have learned. I know you're create, a big Star Wars fan. So by default, <laughs> we're creating st- we're, and we're creating by default. So we can't even say, OK, I, I'm this is my fault. Well, yeah, but it's it's based on all my programming up till now. So how can I? You know, d- yeah. How can I Yoda myself out of this thing? It's funny. You use the, the term Jedi. Mm. And also, um, you know, obviously unlearn what you have learned. Uh, what is it about Star Wars that you love so much? Well, there was a book. Uh, there is a book. I think it's still out there. I have a copy somewhere in my probably storage. But there's, uh, it was called The Force. And it's mm-hmm. by Stuart Wilde, mm-hmm. uh, who wrote a bunch of these books on, you know, your thoughts and creating mm-hmm. things with your thoughts and your words and your act, all those things. And the, that the power of all of that, which we're highly distracted by, by so many other things from that, mm-hmm. called the force. And that's, I believe, partly what, and I could be wrong, what it was based on, or that may the force be with you, mm-hmm. um, whether it's namaste or the force or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's, it's like in Star Wars, there's so many, there's, there's humans, there's bots there's this it's sort of like all the things that are we're going to exist at once you have the you have the the bar scene with all the creatures that are calling themselves whatever they want to call i mean Mm -hmm. are parts of different aspects of what you know there's so many different there's so much there i own that there's so much there if you really watch it and look deeper i think he's such a genius oh Um, yeah and well i I love the way they interweave mm -hmm. the whole I mean, you could say it's almost like a metaphor for, well, it is not almost, it is absolutely a metaphor for the life we live here because the backdrop is all duality. It's the light and the dark until you realize that it's the integration of the two that when they can start to work together, right? And Luke Skywalker and becomes, you know, friends with his father, right? And, and that's sort of this beautiful story of forgiveness and redemption, and, um, you know, the Luke, I am your father moment is, is like, wow, is he so bad? But then by the time it gets to Return of the Jedi, you know, he his dad turns good, right? And mm-hmm. then you realize that all of us are both bad and good. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and it's really about what we are choosing to repress in ourselves that will often dictate how we act out in the world. And the villain never believes he's a villain. Mm-hmm. The villain always believes he's the hero. And always justify, yeah. Deep, deep story inside of that. So, to me, and then the Jedi is able to transcend all of it, mm-hmm. and realize that the the dark side of the Force mm-hmm. interacts with the light side of the Force, and the two work together as a like a flowing river. And a current. Mm-hmm. And I, I just love the metaphors of it. You know, my favorite scene is is when. Um, in Empire Strikes Back, when Luke Skywalker can't get his uh, X fighter out of the swamp, and mm-hmm. then you know J- Yoda walks over and says, "Okay," and you know lifts up his hands, like, <laughs> lifts it out, and then Luke Skywalker comes over and says, "Master, I, I don't believe it. This is impossible." And then you know, of course, that's when Yoda looks at me and says, "And that is why you fail." Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Uh, I think that's such a metaphor for what we experience every single day. Mm-hmm. And we all just get trapped in this illusion because this illusion's really damn good. Yeah. And we made it really damn good. Yeah. Oh, it's so fun. It's so fun, really. I mean, to to it, it you know, they'll I think there'll always be people that love war and profit off of war, right? And there will always be people that want peace and that yeah. want that, right? So that's the yin and the yang. And us trying to say, oh, we're going to get rid of this dark thing. And, or I'm going to, you know, or it this. never happens. Because it's your reality. It's the reality you choose. So if you 
choose to align with, you know, this other thing and focus on it, that's what your reality will be. It won't be all the dark, you know, you won't be engaging with the dark. It's, it's that, that's the game, right? Is, is. But a hero needs a villain. But we're in its pull. And look, a let's villain say, needs a hero. It's polarity planet. We're on polarity pl planet right now. You know, everything's a polarity. It's light. It's dark. It's Democrat. It's Repu it's it's this. Yeah, it's and that. it's funny because we all get stuck in this game because we're like fighting over these elections, and it's like you see it so many times through your lifetime. You get to this age, like we are, right? I'm same age as you. Mm -hmm. You get to this age, and when's your birthday again? November. 6th. November. November sixth. Mm -hmm. So you're 180 days older than me. Okay, okay, so we're so you're Scorpio. I'm Taurus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically, we we get in this game and we've seen the cycle so many times. At some stage, you just kind of go, "Is it just a coincidence that the number of Democrats is always almost perfectly equal to the number of Republicans, or is it just an aspect of polarity, and that whoever wins the election is the one that gets their people to believe they should be more angry?" Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then you realize, wait a minute, this is sort of a cycle of just like, you know, black and white pawns on the chessboard, just playing polarity. And it's it's this game that's just cycling over and over and over again until you finally wake up and say, wait, this is a pattern. This is why society doesn't like pattern recognition. That's built into the game as well, so that we sort of yeah. make people that you know, see patterns like they're crazy, right? Oh, let's mm -hmm. just make them all crazy. There's, it's all a pattern. It's, it's all a pattern. It's all a pattern. What's an, al what's an algorithm? You know, what's all, what's all right. of this? Yeah. Totally right. So for me, when I started realizing all that, I was like, you know, the Republican Party, I'm not Republican and I'm not Democrat, but they asked me in 2010 because they couldn't win anything in California. And they said, look, we, you speak Spanish, you speak Korean, you speak all these languages. Maybe you'd be a good candidate because they didn't have a candidate to run, um, you know, when Barbara Boxer and Feinstein basically, uh, you know, stepped down. And and so um, I decided, OK, well, I'll look into it. And they said, because you're a centrist and, you know, you're, you've got a much better chance of winning than a right wing Republican type of thing. And so and I thought, well, OK, maybe I'll look at it. So I decided I would go on several campaign teams. So I went on like Mitt Romney's campaign team and just to see what it was like. And I became the healthcare policy chair for Meg Whitman. And, uh, you know, because I was from healthcare. So I thought, okay, I'll just see what it's like. And I got into it for a couple of years and I realized I want nothing to do with this. And, and then I was sort of stunned. And I told him, like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to run for politics. I'm not going to run for U.S. Senate. And, and then I went to the ballot box. And I, I hadn't even been following it closely at all. And I went to vote for the U.S. Senate seat position. And the only person running was Kamala Harris. Mm. There was no opponent from the Republican Party. So she ended up becoming, you know, U.S. Senator with no competition. And she didn't really have that's not really a real election then. Right. And then even though she won fair and square, um, but that would have been the one that I would have run against. Mm -hmm. What a coincidence, mm -hmm. right? Now she's vice president. She's one heartbeat away from becoming president of the United States. And I find the whole thing sort of like, okay, is that all just coincidence? Yeah. I don't think so, mm -mm. right? We're all the hero in our own journey. We're all on this hero's journey. I'm making right now this spiritual game. It's very cool. And it's called Cyberverse, and it's, it's C-E-Y-E-B-E-R, and it's augmented reality. So you can wear these glasses, right? And the glasses have a, and they're about the same size as these glasses. Um, the glasses have augmented reality with them, so you can kind of see a 5D world around you. So if I allowed other people to see it, they could see my chakras and where they are, what processes I've gone through this game. And you can see the, the the ones that are really activated have all these geometries over them and everything. They're all moving in motion. I mean, this is like a really fun, cool game. And it teaches you pattern recognition. The game does. So you, you learn how to light up each of your chakras and then get to higher stages of awareness. And mm -hmm. there are lots of cool like pattern recognition games and journeys and quests that you could be in a restaurant one night, you'll get a notification. It'll say, oh, you have to go to the bathroom. And then this avatar of Thoth shows up right? To talk to you and tell you what your next mission thing is. It's very cool. 
It's very so cool. fun. It's like very Pokemon fun. Go, but like spiritual. It's a spiritual life simulation. And yeah, everybody exactly. has their own hero's journey in this game. Mm. Everyone's got their own hero's journey. And the real hero's journey is self-realization. It's realizing and remembering who you are and why you chose everything you chose in your game architecture. So it's a metaphor for life. And as I got into building this game architecture, and our first prototype of it comes out in June, um, I realized maybe this is exactly what real life is. That we we create this very real environment. I mean, the reason I love to go to movies is because they transport me, like Star Wars did, mm -hmm. to a whole other experience. Mm -hmm. And I'm like in there, and you forget your regular life for a couple of hours. Right. It literally will take you when I've had some challenges in my life. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go see a movie and I'll just like get away from whatever it is I've been thinking about. It's like another form of it's entertainment. Yes. But it's also meditative in a way sometimes for me, because if it's a really romantic film and I get so deeply embedded in the film, I feel like I'm part of the film. So if you could make a really real game and now movie mm -hmm. theaters have all these seats that move around for you and everything. I went to the last avatar and they had screens on the sides of the movie theater as well. Mm -hmm. It's more immersive. The whole thing is more immersive. But you could see that if we project that forward with augmented and virtual realities, that we may just want to create these game architectures for us to have every kind of possible experience. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't choose the easiest things. We'd want it to be the realest thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, oh, and if you knew that dying wasn't real, you'd choose all these epic ways to die even. Because mm -hmm. you could experience all of it and you would learn more about yourself through doing that. And then you realize that maybe the whole game architecture is built simply so that the universe could experience itself through your eyes. And the way that it expresses itself to its highest fruition is actually by giving you your absolute uniqueness and your unique perspective. Mm -hmm. It gets really deep when you think about it in those terms, and I realized maybe that's what we're actually living in. Mm. A simulation of our own mind to experience, and maybe there's only one goal, to know ourselves, and by doing that and knowing who we are, learn how to love and how to be loved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing else. Mm. And then you just do it over and over again because you fall in love with that game. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. so real that, you know, the next time you do it, you're like, oh, I can't wait to go back. Well, hopefully it will expand our awareness of things, you know, too. I think what's beautiful about these games is, and that's beautiful about movies is it, it again, it expands our awareness of, of different possibilities of the way things can play out and be, right? And it does, it gets us out of our realities. Um, it gets our mind off of things. It gets our mind off of its normal track of, of, of things. And what's really exciting is when we realize we can do that moment to moment, even without going and seeing the movie, even without, with or without a game. It's, it's something that we can do any moment. We're going down the path of having certain thoughts and we can distract ourselves with the beauty that is, exists around us. And we're constantly, constantly being distracted from the beauty that is around us. The, the, beauty of the person in front of us yeah. the listening to the birds listen i mean interacting with this reality we are constantly being distracted from so whether you need to go into a, another reality to to remember that or not is great do you know what i'm saying so i think it's it it's like you can read different books that all say the same thing, but one is going to speak to you, right? In a way that the others didn't. So I think it's the same with, with the metaverse, with the, the different realities that we're, we're dealing with is whatever it takes, you know what I mean? To get to what you're talking about, which is expanding our consciousness. And um, I'm, I'm really enjoying 
this reality so much more. You know, it's like that extreme of like, oh, because we see the future coming in and we know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the metaverse is coming. We know that mm -hmm. all of this, you know, AI and all of the chips and the this and the that and the robotics are coming in so quick. You know, you see all the towers being built, you know, it's got to have something to do with that AI coming in. So you've got to say, okay, you know, they're going to be here soon. You know, it's all being created. So I just like literally you know, I'm talking to the birds, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm engaging with nature. And that's one of the reasons I went to the Cotswolds was just to, you know, I, I want to go on the real game first, I want to go to these places and see the real thing first, you know, because yeah. there's so much of the real earth that I haven't seen. I want I want that game, you know what I mean? So it's, it's sort of, there's so much, this is where it's always interesting being human, you know, and not robotic and still human before we go fully in that direction is, is there's a real desire for tangible, real things too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A real kiss, holding someone's hand, really the intimacy, because we're being pulled so far from intimacy, real intimacy, real connection, seeing and appreciating each other appreciating each other instead of always looking for how we're different how we're not alike how we're you know how how we're being so pulled in that direction that there's a part at least a part of me that's going so in the other direction while i can and appreciating the human connection um and seeing the beauty of it while it lasts while it's here um that's amazing mm. i love i love the way you articulated that and it re it deeply resonates for me because i think if anything that i'm hoping that people will learn through this game is that the only way that because some people think that we live in an escape room right it's mm. like an escape room game have you ever done an escape room no. right escape rooms are fun I, okay. I do them all the time like corporate escape room go to like some place and they put you in this background, they give you the background script of the place, and then you have to like figure out how to break out of that place. Right. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and so a lot of people think, and they're very popular these days, that's like corporate retreats use them all the time. And they have all these different themes. There's like a Western version of it, or like an alien version of it, or an alchemical version of it, you name it. And they're fun. They're really fun. You have to decrypt things and everything. They take usually an hour, sometimes more, a little bit more than an hour. Cool. And you're on a clock. That's an important aspect of the game. You're on a clock, it, just like we have to be on a clock here, right? So the whole construct has to still have that time scarcity associated with it. But this game of life, the only way that you escape this room is by learning to fall in love with it just as it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's through the transcendence because we fall in love with every moment. And that means we also fall in love with ourselves because we can't fall in love with the world around us until we fall in love with ourselves fully. Not just the aspects that we think we're projecting around us, but actually our true selves. Mm -hmm. And that's such a beautiful thing to me. You know, it's the kiss. Mm -hmm. It's the holding someone's mm -hmm. hand. It's mm -hmm. the intimacy. It's the moment walking, you know, through Central Park. And it's like <laughs> enjoying every second. What is that film? There's such a beautiful film where at the it's a it's an Italian film where at the end they stream all the kisses from all the movies together. It's a guy who owns a movie theater. Oh, Cinema Paradiso. Yes. Yes. So it's like Cinema Paradiso where I mean, there's something when you watch the end of that movie, when you see all of those. I don't know where he came up with these kisses, but where it all comes together and you just it's so. To me, that's the beauty of life, right? Is those are the moments that really take your breath that you just go, that's it. It's it's so it, it's so simple, you know. It's really we complicate everything. For some reason, we love. I'm guilty of it. We complicate everything, and the truth is, it's all so so simple. How is it that it so, seems so simple? Like you're aging backwards. <laughs> it's a lack of maturity, Robert. 
<laughs> just, well, then, don't, just don't get more too power serious. To it. Don't get too serious and too mature about everything. Don't do too many of those escape rooms. You know, just just <laughs> make out more, have fun, do these wonderful podcasts. I I just think you're the most wonderful. You have the most wonderful charismatic, charming, open, loving energy. You're so brilliant. Your mind. I mean, I see my son and I have no concept. I mean, his mind is like, I mean, clearly he got that side from his father. I'm like, you know, if you want to act or you want to be creative, here's some, you know, he's just, so I see that. And I have such a, um, you know, I, 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 it's such, it's so sexy that, that, that it is that smartiness that you have. And you know, just, and your openness to everything. And you're, you're, it's, you're staying on top of what's coming and you know, what's coming and you see what's coming, but then you also have this beautiful spiritual side to you. That's, that's still, it's because it, that's it, right? We have to somehow balance what's coming and what's coming in with, you know, keeping it in alignment with love and keeping it in alignment with, with um, serving how are we serving? Because that feels good, you know, to be of service. It's just not because it's, uh, you know, a box you're checking on the, you know, okay. It's just because it feels good, you know, to, to create things, to use your smartiness. <laughs> I tell my son, use your smartiness, please, to do some good because there's enough people using their smartiness, you know, for their own benefit, which God bless them. Nobody's, you know, whatever. But to to at least have a win win somewhere, I always say, make it at least a win win in anything you do, you know, okay, you can profit, you can get something great out of it. But can you find the win win where it is genuinely a benefit or of service? And, you know, that's it. I mean, I don't know. I, I think we're, you know, you know, I talked to him about judgment and discernment as well, you know. I said, people do things many different ways and it's not our job to, to judge them, but it is our job to learn from it mm-hmm. and have discernment, right? So it, it's like, there's so many ways that, that, that we're, things are being played out. And so yeah. look at how they're being played out and pick and choose with discernment, not judging how they're being played out because that's what we're here to do. We're all here to play it out in our own way. Um, but to discern uh how you were gonna how yours is gonna play out you know kelly you're an amazing woman what is next for you oh gosh i don't i don't know i don't know i've got what what do i have today i'm i just do my day really i do my day i've got travel coming up where are you off to we're going back to europe for a little bit Mm-hmm. We've been in LA for a month. We're going to go back to Europe. Then we're going to come back to LA. Now, Hermes um, is your, 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 the father of your children is European, right? He's, um, yes, he's German. He's, he's German. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so they probably, you spend time mostly in Germany or in France? No, in Monaco a lot. So yeah, in Monaco mostly, mm-hmm. but we travel. I mean, we, we all travel a lot. So we're all, do you, I don't do even you have a house in Monaco or do you just stay and do you get a, a rent a, yeah, I have a place I stay there mm-hmm. regularly. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a place I've been staying for for a while. Monaco yeah. is such a trip for me. I mean, I go there often, mm-hmm. and uh, and next time I go, I'll definitely let you know I'm coming because I do a lot yeah. of like blockchain stuff there, and um, it's such a different world. Monaco is such a different world. It is it's like cool though. It's it's cool. very you cool. Know- it's very cool. It's got like this beautiful contrast. It's like. It's like France with all the beauty and form and, you know, maybe a little less on the function side. Maybe there's some more aspect of function there also, but without the shame against money and things like that, right, which definitely exists in France for sure. Uh, but it's it's like a, if you've got it, flaunt it type of place. It's a It's a very cool place. It's got a vibe. Yeah, it's a power vortex for sure. Big, it's time. A- <laughs> Big time. All you do is you come in there, you see all the yachts, and you're like, okay, this is a power vortex. This, this is, is a like power a- vortex. Yeah, everyone's yeah. like, you know, some oligarch somewhere, right? It's uh, it's really quite an interesting place, but I, I love it because of the French 
Italian influence. It's like that intersection of France and Italy. And it took Grace Kelly to get everyone there. It was beautiful. You well, know, that's they... another one you remind me of. Mm. You're like a combination. You're like the American, I guess, Catherine Deneuve slash Grace Kelly. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. You really feel her energy in Monaco. It's incredible. I feel her energy there all the time when I'm there. What she what she brought to Monaco. Oh, yeah. Obviously, Monaco was wonderful before, but she it brought so much of what created this power of art, you know, that it is today. It's oh, really, she definitely uh, put kind of the mystery, intrigue, and uh, majesty into the royalty mm-hmm. of the Grimaldi dynasty there, mm-hmm. which I think is fascinating. And I would definitely uh, love to uh, to see you sometime when I go to Monaco next. And uh, or when I'm in, you know, where do you spend most of your time here in the U.S.? Is it L.A. or more New York? More recently, L.A. Yeah, it used mm-hmm. to be New York, um, but more recently, L.A. So when I'm back, I'll reach out and we'll do something. I want to come back to, to Laguna. I love it. So beautiful there. One last area. question for you. Okay. What do you think of the latest installment of Gossip Girl? Mm-hmm. You know, I have... <laughs> I think it's cool. I think it's of the time, you know. I they think talk Gossip about, Girl... I don't know if you've watched it. I've, I've watched a couple of them uh, because I draw geometry while, you know, watching it. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny. And uh, it's kind of a guilty pleasure, I guess, in some way, shape or form, hopefully without the guilt. But yeah. they talk about the, the original series on the show all the time. It's yeah, the weirdest yeah. thing. Have you seen it mm-hmm. at all? I've seen a little bit of it. I know one of the actors in it, and obviously, I, you know, I think it's so cool that that they did it. Um, yeah, it's 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 of it's it's of now, right? I think the old Gossip Girl is a classic. You know, it's going to be, you know, hopefully, will stay a classic. It was very sort of wonderful at the time, and people still enjoy it. But this, you know, this you always have to bring in the new, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's exciting, exciting. Well. It's been such a pleasure talking with you oh, and too. I'm excited about Wiser. I'm definitely looking forward to uh, to getting uh, that app and, and having a look. And, and hopefully mm-hmm. if you want me to do something on there, I'd be happy to. Oh, we'd and, love it. Um, and, and anything for you, for sure. And mm-hmm. also, uh, where can people find you? I know you're big on Instagram um, and it's just at Kelly Rutherford. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, But where else can they find you if they'd like to learn more about your wisdom teachings because i know you have quite a few i don't i mean that's it right now i'm pretty much on instagram i'll be on wiser soon Mm -hmm. um i mean i'm already on there but in terms of content i'll be Mm -hmm. creating content soon there um that's it right now that's it well good for you i'm going to be looking out for when does escort boys come out i believe at the end of the year I, i think december and it's going to be subtitled in English, I guess. I think they might uh, dub it. I don't know if it's going to be subtitled. People are getting so much more used to subtitles now and, and you know, enjoying mm-hmm. it. I'll, I'll find out. I don't know yet. I don't know enough. I just I mean, was. I speak French, so I'll, I'll happily watch it in French. I listen love to you it. speak French. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. Un petit peu. Un petit peu. <laughs> Très bien. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm looking oh. for it. When do you think it'll be out? I, b- I believe at the end of the year. I'm not sure yet. I'll start promoting it on my Instagram when I know. I was just texting with them yesterday. Are I they going to have it on December. Netflix or something also? Or is it going to be on Prime? Prime? Some mm-hmm. Prime. Amazon Prime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Prime video. Yeah, or something. I- I've got to look. She-, she just texted me yesterday. Excellent. Um, I'm going to send you a-, a trailer and a link for Codex as oh, well to cool. so send to your son. For Hermes. He'll love mm-hmm. that. Yeah, He'll lo- I can't wait for you two to meet. I would love to meet him. So just let yeah. me know when. Happy okay. to do it. Okay. All right. Well, thank All you right. so much, Kelly. Such a pleasure seeing you. Have a wonderful rest of your day and um, all the best and, and fall in love with life. Much love. Thank you. You All too. Right. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.